Minh Thúy xin kính chào quý vị hôm nay thứ Sáu, 12 tháng 7, 2024. Đến với VATV hôm nay gồm có phỏng vấn đặc biệt và nhạc lá bồ đề. Kính thưa quý vị, nếu nhìn vào biến động ở miền Nam trong những năm đầu thập niên năm 1960, những quyết định quân sự sai lầm ở miền Trung, cuộc đảo chính năm 1963 và những hoạt động ngày càng mạnh mẽ của Cộng sản ở nông thôn. Như Frank Scotton đã trình bày trong các kỳ trước, cơ hội dân chủ có thể có ở miền Nam Việt Nam hay không? Khi so sánh ở miền Nam, ngoài mặt Bắc Việt có vẻ đoàn kết hơn. Ở Bắc Việt không có biểu tình. Các nhân viên cao cấp quân đội Bắc Việt có vẻ quyết định đồng nhất. Các hoạt động của Cộng sản ở nông thôn miền Nam Việt Nam ngày càng bạo dạn hơn. Phải chăng điều này có nghĩa rằng mầm hạt dân chủ ở miền Nam Việt Nam đã chết kể ngay từ những giây phút đầu tiên? Ông Frank Scotton, nhân viên phòng thông tin Hoa Kỳ, không nghĩ vậy. Ngoài những tiếp xúc với dân chúng ở miền quê, ông cũng theo dõi những hoạt động dân chủ ở miền Nam Việt Nam và nhìn thấy những bước tiến dân chủ thực tiễn như Hội đồng Lập Hiến, Hội đồng Cố vấn tỉnh. Frank Scotton cho rằng, Tiến trình dân chủ ở miền Nam không hề khác với những tiến trình dân chủ ở các quốc gia khác như Đại Hàn, Đài Loan. Theo quan niệm cá nhân của ông Frank Scotton cũng nêu ra những ưu nhược điểm của việc bầu cử hội đồng tỉnh. Cụ thể hơn, ông nêu ra những ưu điểm của vấn đề cần có. Những khác biệt ý kiến như trưởng phòng CIA William Colby trình bày. Minh Thúy mời quý vị theo dõi phần 7 phỏng vấn đặc biệt lần này qua suy nghĩ của ông Frank Scotton về Việt Nam trong những năm đầu thập niên năm 1960 do Phan Lê Dũng, Võ Thành Nhân và Minh Thúy thực hiện. But it seems like the North has already uh, politically evolved faster than in the South, at least, because there, there seems to be, uh, uh, you're talking about the unity between the different organizations in the North, and they seem to bind together, and they have a political strain that's really clearly more obvious than we do in the South, because most people would argue, like, what, what would be the competing version of the communist view from the, the well, North that, that we don't that, have? That needed to evolve, but I, th but I thought that I thought there, were, there was a possibility, I wouldn't go far as to say probability, but there was a possibility that could evolve if, if the uh, military circumstances in the rural areas could stabilize a bit. Uh, and and there, were, there were kind of some, I would say like in hydraulics, there were some eddies of uh, encouragement. I, I thought that the, con the Constituent Assembly to draw up a constitution was a, was a positive step, um, n not one that I, I was very much involved with, but just as an observer uh, and a reader of things and occasionally conversing with someone like Dang Ban Sung when I would be down in, in, in Saigon, friends introducing me to them. Yep. But, but don't I you think that's still that the, in, in the city and it seems to be like in, among the elite? I'm talking here well, the but, local uh, and but, the peasant. But there was some, the, in, in the Constituent Assembly, there was some serious conversation about having elected, uh, not just elected advisory province councils, but elected province assemblies and elected province chiefs. Now the, the, the South Vietnam military vetoed that. So that when you got a, you know, the Constituent Assembly had recommended it, uh, but it was vetoed by the military council. And so when the constitution was adopted, it did not provide for elected province chiefs. Now my thinking, and I, I apologize if any, anybody watching thinks that, uh, you know, I'm, I'm being unnecessarily derogatory, but I, I think that the, those who commanded the Vietnamese military at the time felt that elected province chiefs, elected province governments would vitiate the chain of corruption that was already well established at that time, whereby uh, 
the corps commanders pretty much determined who would be province chiefs. And uh, some provinces were relatively lucrative. Let's say you look at my old province of Bindin, for example, building the Fukat Air Base, uh, the Queen Yan Harbor, uh, the movement of supplies uh, on Highway 19 to the Highlands, uh, the, the uh, supplies for the Korean division, you know, transportation was a lot of... So you think the Avin is doing this for their own benefit rather than the country's benefit is what you're seeing? Well, I thought that I thought that the country would would definitely benefit by having elected province governments, and some friends of mine in the Vietnamese military agreed. You know, you know, one of my friends again, uh, uh, Thuy, who by that time was a lieutenant colonel, he said, "Well, not all those elected to be province chiefs will be competent." But then not all battalion commanders are competent. Yes. So uh, the level of competence in every field has to be, has to be raised. And also the question of uh, whether to having the elected uh, official at the local, I think a couple of people from the uh, Avin told me that it's uh, also, they are thinking about communist infiltration and you have, uh, you could possibly have a communist being elected as one of the officers. Is what they are against? Is that just an excuse or is that uh, uh, something that could happen? Uh, it may not be a, a simply an excuse. It may have been a fear uh, organizationally that that would happen, but uh, um, I, I would say it would it'd just be one of those things that you had to, you had to risk for the principle. You know, the, 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 the principal difference between us and the communists was that we believed that people choose their leadership. Uh, the communists believed that they, at least uh, temporarily, had to impose leadership because they knew better than anybody else what had to be done. See? I see. So uh, it, was a, it was a choice that we, we could have made, but we didn't. Now, I, I know that... Uh, in, you'll excuse me for jumping ahead a decade or so, but I know that you're going to speak with my, my friend, my brother, Frank Snepp, so let, let me mention something about, uh, about, about uh, Frank. Uh, I didn't have uh, a lot of respect for a lot of um, American officers there, but I, I developed tremendous respect for for uh, Frank very quickly, and, and here's how it happened. Um, uh, I worked uh, for a time for Bill Colby when he was running the, uh, the Rural Development Program in MACV uh, with the rank of ambassador, and he, and he had pulled me in, and uh, a remarkable person in many respects and said that he wanted me to be his special assistant for field problems. And I initially said that I, I didn't want to do that because, uh, you know, first of all, there were uh, a lot of things that we did that I didn't agree with. His response to that was, if you and I would agree on everything, I wouldn't need you. <laughs> okay, and then I told him, still trying to weasel out of it, I said, well, um, you know, also, I'm not a very good office person. You know, I'm not comfortable in an office environment. And he said, if I were to see you in the office every day, I would be disappointed. Okay. It's a hell, hell of a thing. So the, the thing that in your mind and in his mind are completely different. Yeah. What he's having in for you and what you thinking you were doing. With, uh, yeah. So I wound up being his special assistant. Now, there was a time in 71 where he went back to Washington, D.C., on consultations uh, and to see his family and, and a couple of other things. And while he was there, Congressman Pete McCluskey, a Korean War decorated veteran, saw him and said that he was going to come out to make a, make a kind of eyeball visit on Vietnam and he wanted to see, see it as it was, not as people wanted him to see it. Mm. So Colby sent what we call a back channel message to uh, Saigon and said he wanted me to be the escort for McCloskey. 
much later, when I expressed some surprise when he was back in Saigon, he said, well, I knew you wouldn't let anybody lie to him, you know, that you would, you would be tough when you had to and you wouldn't let it happen. And I remember him saying, in our system of government, the worst thing you can do is lie to an elected representative of the people. It doesn't make any difference what you think about that person. It's the principle. So I uh, accompanied uh, McCloskey. Once someone was going to lie to him in Da Nang, I interrupted, didn't allow that to happen. In Kuang Ai province, uh, McCloskey wanted to go to the site where an American unit had murdered more than 500 Vietnamese hamlet dwellers. You're talking about My Lai, or is that a different? Uh, well, it, it, actually it's in uh, Tu Kung hamlet. Mm -hmm. If you looked at the old maps that the military used, that hamlet is shown as My Lai 4, because they never got the names of hamlets right, I would say. But it's actually Tu Kung hamlet. So at the uh, 23rd Division headquarters, he was told by the deputy division commander that it wasn't possible to bring him there because it was insecure. So I waited uh, politely until the coffee break and then pulled the assistant division commander and said, you know, that doesn't wash. You know, we're, we're going to go there. And if you don't arrange it, I'm going to arrange it through the uh, district chief. So uh, he capitulated and, uh, and we went there. and. And uh, with me interpreting, he saw the ditch where more than 100 bodies were extracted. We walked through the hamlet. It was, it was like, a, like an old west ghost town, empty houses. Uh, in other hamlets around there, people were returning. People were in the fields working, not in that one. So uh, Pete McCloskey was shaken by the experience, um, he, but he digested it. Anyway, um, a series, uh, uh, and we formed a friendship. Pete McCloskey is still alive here in California. We last spoke uh, about three or four months ago on the phone. Well, um, the, uh, in, in 75, uh, I already knew uh, Frank Snip. We'd been in a couple of meetings together, and I, I knew he was a, a sharp-minded, perceptive uh, officer with important responsibilities. Um, the Assistant Secretary of, uh, of State, Phil Habib, was bringing a congressional delegation late March, early April. 75, critical time, to uh, Vietnam. And uh, Pete McCluskey was one of the members of Congress who was going to be included, and he told Phil Habib that he wanted, wanted me in, in the group, too. Mời quý vị đón xem phần 8, phỏng vấn ông Frank Scotton, nhân viên cao cấp Sở Ngoại vụ Hoa Kỳ, sẽ được phát hình vào tối thứ Sáu, 19 tháng 7, 2024